Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to Night Light. Hope everyone's having a good week. Um, I have a great show lined up for you tonight, as well as Wednesday with uh, Mary Joyce. Thursday, uh, David Collis is going to have a fascinating show with uh, Reverend Sean Whittington, uh, Gloria Amen Dola uh, and Barbara are going to be talking on Friday. So have a great uh, week of shows ahead of us. So uh, just tune in and uh, learn something. Um, okay, for tonight's show, a friend of mine who is also a distant neighbor is our guest. Ed Hashbarger and I have met at several frack awareness conferences in the Upper Ohio River Valley and collabor collaborated elsewhere. Ed is a Christian Marine from the Gulf War, a retired police officer, survival instructor, and concerned environmentalist. Yeah, it's a great guy, too. Uh, fracking was brought to our area a little under 10 years ago and presented as a way to financially stimulate and revitalize the Rust Belt. Uh, the corporations and elected officials presented their safety studies, but did their science add up? Um, but you know, uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, the um, benefits to the communities. You know, our area uh, it was told uh, you know, the science behind the opioids was non-addictive. And one of the most uh, memorable photos of the opioid situation uh, was a, you know, a couple, like 50-year-old uh, grandparents passed down the front seat with needles in their arms and toddlers in the cars, uh, you know, you know, the child uh, re restraining seats in the uh, back seat. So, you know, that's our neighborhood. So um, I've heard uh, many locals talk about, you know, they had unusual colds early this winter before the, you know, Rona. So why does it seem like the Ohio Valley seems to be experimented on and given – bogus science you know, it's, uh, so I just want to get you know talk, talk about the science that it impacts us but you know we also need to consider that there are, you know, the Ohio River is nearly a thousand miles long and how many people get their drinking water 
downstream from us. Um, this topic isn't just a local issue. It affects people all the way downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. So it's more of a regional um, topic. So um, I just want to w- welcome Ed to the show. Hi, Ed. How are you? Not bad, Mark. How about yourself? Oh, I, I am fine. Just enjoying a nice, hot summer evening. Um, you know, the, you know, fracking has been a controversial topic. It, you know, obviously, it's off um, you know, the chart charts at the you know, back burner at the moment. You know, it's really about one news story now. But um, you know, there you know, fracking has been touted as a way for America to be independent of foreign oil. Um, so there are you know, so, some good things that uh, have come from th- this issue. Um, you know, f- first of all, uh, maybe we should take a look at what is the fracking process and you can uh, de- define it for the audience, and, and we can get into some more of the uh, benefits, how, how it works, you know, how, how it benefits the communities, et cetera. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say hi to everybody out there this evening, and I'm, I'm glad you can enjoy, join us this evening. Uh, this is a very – I think this is a very important topic because it it affects not just um, our well-being, our our health, but it also affects the planet as a whole. Uh, As Mark said earlier, um, I'm kind of a a little bit of a different type of uh, environmentalist. Um, When you think of environmentalists, you think of environmentalists who who tend to be on the left, you know, they lean towards the Democratic Party or being more liberal in their viewpoints. Uh, but myself, being a conservative Republican, uh, I joined the fight of my brothers and sisters who are on the left in regards to dealing with these, uh, these, these industrial impacts that, it, that affect our planet, our health, our well-being. Um, and fracking – People really just don't understand, I, I think, the, the, the total impact that what fracking does to our environment. It, 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 not just, it just doesn't just affect water, but it affects air quality. It affects, your, it, it affects the ground itself that we grow our fruits and vegetables out of. Um, it, it hits a wide spectrum of areas. But going back to originally what Mark asked about about fracking fracking is basically drilling into the earth and i'm I'm going to try to keep things simple because i i've I've learned it for me life is easy if i can do it if i can if i can say it as simple as possible and kind of refer to those books you see at the bookstore that called uh uh, we'll just say fracking for dummies or driving for dummies or or gardening (laughs) for dummies everybody's seen that book so I'm going to try to keep it that simple because that's how I understand things. I try to understand it as simple as can be. And basically, fracking is drilling into the earth, and we're talking about – we're not talking about a few hundred feet. We're talking about thousands, ten thousands of feet into the ground. We're talking about going miles deep and miles out to the left and to the right pretty much in every direction. We're talking about injecting fresh water mixed with – a variety of chemicals, well over a thousand different chemicals in, into that solution, along with silica sand, and that water is put into the ground and fractures the rock. The tiny silica sand holds those fractures open long enough for them to extract the natural gases and oils that happen to be in the earth. 
And uh, the, the thing is in all this, we're talking about millions of gallons of water used to frack a hole. And, and think back here one second to what I said. It's fresh water, folks. They can't use salt water. They don't use wastewater. They have to use fresh water. And if uh, a typical hole drilled from a drill pad. Now, keep in mind, I want everybody to try to visualize if you take a piece of paper and you lay that piece of paper down flat on your desk and you look at that piece of paper, it's square. And within that square, you could have, if you take your eraser of, of a regular pen or take the back end of the clicky pen and stick that down, you could put that on that, on, on that piece of paper 20, 30, 40 times depending on the size of, uh, uh, or de depending on the laterals that they want to drill from that particular pad. So a particular pad can have as few as, as five drill holes, and it can have up to as, not, as many as 40 drill holes on that particular pad itself. And we're talking about going out in different directions. And we're talking about going down a mile, maybe a mile and a half, two miles, and then we're talking about going out anywhere from two to four miles. The technology is getting better for them to continue to go out further in the directions that they go. And when they go, those holes, each one of those holes can hold anywhere from 2 million up to 10 million gallons of water. Now we're talking about two to 10 million gallons of water. We're talking fresh water. I want people to kind of visualize for their in, in their mind if they can five million gallons of water that is put into the ground that can no longer be used in the cycle of life that water has now become permanently tainted they cannot clean it up they cannot filter it out that water is shot forever and a lot of people probably sit there and think, well, okay, it, it's water. What, what's the big deal about all of that? I did a kind of a little bit of research, and everybody can do this by just going on their laptop and, and Googling, uh, Googling it. But a person who lives to be 80 years old, there's roughly, roughly in, with that person, they roughly live – 29,200 days. If they, if they live from the time that they're born to the time they reach 80 years of age, they would have 29,200 days on this earth. If you consume a gallon of water a day, you will consume 29,200 gallons of water in your lifetime. Now, I want you to think about that. That's fresh water that you need to survive. Now, that's on average because a lot of people drink pop, they drink milk, they drink other things. 29,200 gallons of water in a lifetime. How many people can live on 5 million gallons of water, folks? How many people can live on 5 million gallons of water? See, you know, in the military, we're told that you can live three days without water. In the military, they teach you that you, no matter what you do or what the circumstances you're in, you need water every three days to live. Preferably, you need it every day, but a human body could go three days without water. After that, the kidneys start shutting down, your organs start shutting down, and you die. And that has to be fresh water. Folks, when that water is used in the fracking process, that water is no longer viable for the cycle of life. And it just blows me away, Mark. And that's just one example of maybe some of the things we're going to talk about this evening. But mm -hmm. I, I think people really, really need to realize the importance of fresh water in this world. We just got done talking uh, here just before the show started with Barbara, and we were talking about uh, all this rain coming down, and, and she's getting a lot of rain where she's at. Well, in the Ohio Valley, we're looking to go on a, a week to about 10-day stretch of no, no rain, uh, which some people like. Other people, like myself, who have a garden, you know, I, I, I'd like to see water every day if we can have it. But we're, throughout the world, worldwide, there's a fresh water shortage 
in the world. A Catholic priest, of, a friend of ours who passed away here a few years back, he, he was from Italy, and he explained to me, he, he told me, he goes, Eddie, the next major war in the world is going to be fought over fresh drinking water. And it, 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 it saddens my heart that right now in this country we're taking millions of gallons of water and purposely ruining it so it's no longer viable for the cycle of life. It just, it, it just, it, it just boggles my mind, Mark. So, Ed, so that's – but when you were ha- having us imagine – you know, uh, a well pad having uh, numerous uh, you know uh, you know fr- fracking episodes on it uh, you know, multiple uh, fracks so that could be up to ten million gallons per frack and per hole. That, that's yeah per hole so that that yeah. is you know tens of millions of gallons of water that is r- removed from ever being used to you know, um Drink, feed the uh, uh, cows. You know, put put on uh, you know the crops during you know this drought that uh, we might be experiencing next week. Um, you, you know, it, it can never be used again because it is tainted with all the chemicals. Right. It, it's, it's not just the chemicals, but then. You know, the thing is, is when this water, it's, it's not just contaminated with the chemicals put in there, but it's contaminated with silica sand. It's contaminated mm-hmm. with radium-228, 226, 224, um, H2S, gas uh, is, is mixed into, into that when it comes up. Now, obviously, you're not drinking the gas, but uh, that gas is, is also very dangerous. We'll talk about a little bit about that here in a little bit. Okay. But... You know, the, the thing is, is I, I really don't think people really realize, because a lot of people right now can go to their, go to their tap and turn on, the, turn on the tap and fresh water comes out for them. But there's many, many places in this world right now where they have absolutely no fresh water whatsoever. And right. um, they either have to have it uh, trained in or they have to have it piped in from long distances. I know you've got a lot of countries in the Middle East that uh, um, they do kind of what our Navy does, where they take seawater and they de- desalt it by running it through a process so they can use it as drinking water, um, which is a very uh, difficult process. It's not, a very, it's not an easy process, but it can be done, um, and it's very costly. But it could be done, and, and, and keeping in mind, even our ocean, to get a lot of stuff dumped in it, does not have the te- chemical concentration that a fracked well with, you know, and I'm just going to use a middle number of 5 million. If you take 5 million gallons of water, um, and that's, like I said, because it's anywhere between 2 to 10 million to frack a hole, but 5 million gallons of water, the chemical makeup that's within that, that they mix into that, that slur that's in there, can never be taken out. Well, and it, that reminds me that uh, is it uh, Jamaica? Was it Jamaica that uh, got hit by that hur- hurricane a couple of years ago, and their infrastructure is uh, destroyed? Uh, they don't have. You know, I'm just throwing that out as an, an example where um, they could use fresh water. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. 
Um, it could, you know, their whole it system could be. was destroyed down there, and I think I think we're in a we as the United States we ship them fresh water down there. You know the thing is too is you know the thing that bothers me is you know our politicians and our our, our corporate people know the importance of fresh water. That's why they themselves, between governments and private co- uh, uh, corporations, have bought up large uh, underground aquifer systems, not just in this country, but all over the world. I, if I'm not mistaken, and, and again, uh, folks, I, I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Like I said, I, I, I am a conservative Republican. I mean, first and foremost, I, I'm, I, I'm a born-again Christian. I, I'm a believer in Christ. So, uh, you know, I love everyone. But the thing is, is the Bush family is one of the one of the families involved that bought up uh, several large aquifer systems down in, in Central and South America, bought it up because they know they know that it's going to get down to who has drinking water and who doesn't have drinking water. Because you could go and, 21 days without eating. I mean, you can you can go a long time without eating, but again, you can only go three days without good viable drinking water. And people need to okay. think about it, that. Yeah. It, um, and you just mentioned the uh, aquifers. You know, um, I, 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 I we can come back to this uh, in a minute, but. Uh, where is the water uh, being taken from? Can, can you explain that to the audience and yes. how, how and how is it being taken to the pads for fracking? Okay, currently, currently, water is being taken from several different sources. Uh, at least within the Ohio Valley here that, that I'm aware of. Uh, they're being taken from strip ponds. They're being taken from creeks and streams. They're being taken from the Ohio River. They're being taken from municipalities where they're, they're able to go up within our county um, and pay a flat rate to hook up to the hydrant and fill up water to take to a frac site. So this water is being in, in some, I mean, people who live in areas where fracking is currently going on, I'm sure they've seen these black hoses that they have rolled along the highways where you see them stretching across the field. Those mm-hmm. hoses are making their ways to strip ponds where fresh water is accumulated from rain, fl- uh, uh, rain, uh, rain fl- uh, fall, as well as maybe some underground springs that have supplied water resources to those strip ponds, and they pump water out. Now, the thing is, is when, when they pump water out of places like the Ohio River or like uh, creeks and streams that are mapped, creeks and streams, those places there, they're supposed to be metered, okay, to let them know how many, you know, let the state know how much water they're taking from these locations. But, The metering has to be done by guess who? Oil and gas. Oil and gas, the companies are responsible for letting the state know how many gallons of water that they consumed out of, say, the Ohio River or out of Yellow Creek or one of the main creeks in the area. They have to let the state know how many gallons of water they've taken. So it's kind of – it's on the honor system here. It's self-regulated. You know, the thing – it's not – well, it is, but it isn't. It's being regulated because what they're telling oil and gas, look, we trust you. We know you're not going to lie to us. You're going to tell us exactly how much you're taking out. Now, they wouldn't do that for you or me. You know, they wouldn't say, hey, Mark, uh, by the way, you know, the city, the city you live in the, uh, the uh, a municipality, and that municipality may come up to you and say, hey, Mark, uh, we'd like you to let us know every three months how much water you use in your house so we can bill you for it. Mm-hmm. That'd be nice. It'd, it'd be nice if the IRS would uh, 
So yeah, just <laughs> to, to, just tell, you don't have to show us any file, anything. Show us any receipts. Just tell us how much you think you earned. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, the the thing is, is with the state of Ohio, they're kind of slow. At, I mean, slow at at at, at uh, implementing things that can protect the people and to protect the environment. You know, in other states, they they've they've kind of caught on to. Uh, the oil and gas industry by, uh, you know, metering at the well pads or metering at these uh, creeks and streams and and ponds and stuff. But in Ohio, you'll like this. I'm sure your listeners will like this too. See, in the state of Ohio, uh, at a a pad, so let's, we'll just take any pad, for example, pad A. um, Each pad has to be uh, um, metered, okay, so they know how much, flow is coming up, how much natural gas is coming up, how much oil they, they, they're getting in, in the process. And, but here in Ohio, how it works is, is oil and gas, have to, they tell the state how much cubic feet of gas they produced out of the ground or how, much, how many barrels of oil or cubic feet of oil they produced out of the ground. In other states, there's an actual meter at the, at the, at, at the wellhead. So when, when those different gases come up or, or the different oils, or the oil that comes up, that's actually metered there, and, and, and they're being taxed on what comes out of the ground at that moment. In Ohio, it's on the honor system. Of course, the oil and gas gets to tell you how much. So they could have produced, and I'm going to use a, a, a wild number there, they could have produced 100 billion uh, cubic feet of gas, okay, could have actually came up out of that particular pad, but they may only report that only 50 billion cubic feet came up out of the ground, and, and that's all they have to report, and that's all they have to pay tax on. Okay. Okay. The, the, the problem is here is, is in, in the state of Ohio, they've allowed oil and gas to kind of write the laws. They've allowed oil and gas to kind of even police themselves, you could say. Uh, you know, and I'm sure people, you know, the state will get upset with me saying that, but, you know, that, that's pretty much about where it's at because, uh, I, you know, I've never heard of, you know, that's like me going to the gas station and pumping gas. And then I go up to pay for my gas, and I tell them, I tell them how much gas I actually took. So I, you know, I nice. could have pumped, I, yeah, I could have pumped twenty gallons of gas in my car, but all, I only need to tell them I only pumped ten. You know, and they have to take my word for it. I, I mean, just okay. it, it's just nonsense like that. I, I just don't understand it. You know, the, the whole thing is, is, you know, a while back, Mark. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but his name is Bill Gorby, very good friend of mine, his wife, Sherry, uh, a, a lovely person. We got together. Now, they're, they're kind of, they lean left. You know, they're Democrat, and they lean to the left. They're more, uh, they're more of an environmentalist than me, uh, way more than me. Uh, they, they really do care about the environment. Uh, they're very good people. And, and we got yeah, together. Are. Yeah, we got together, you know, them being to the left and me being to the right. And we got together and we formed an environmental group uh, in Jefferson County. Um, and, and what we did was is we decided to go into this whole deal using a different approach. And please, folks out there, please don't take it the wrong way when I, when I, when I try to tell you, because, again, I, I try to make it as simple as I can, but – the problem is, is when I first started in this whole thing, I, I was a little bit perplexed about the protesting and, and all this stuff, like dressing up like zombies and walking around, that this is what's going to happen to you if, if you don't do something about oil and gas, or going there and shouting people down. I just never found that approach to be a good approach, and, and, and either did Bill and his wife. and So we started this group. Uh, the Jefferson County Citizens for Environmental Truth. We, we thought that if we form an organization that could hold uh, corporations and politicians accountable by using science against them, 
using the, 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 the thing that they try to use against us, but using facts and figures that we receive from various professors and different colleges and different labs. So we took the fight to them that way, and it turned out to be a very successful thing here. We were able to get compressor stations moved. We were able to get pipelines uh, taken care of. Now, now, as far as getting a compressor station moved, that we only participated in that particular movement. That that the movement of a compressor station really falls on the shoulders uh, of another gentleman, and he, uh, his name is right there, and it's looting me right now. Um, Oh, he's a big. He's a country singer uh, locally, oh, and I'm sure you know him, Mark. Um, oh my, he'll end up coming to me here shortly. But anyways, uh, we all got yeah. together to to fight this compressor station and have have it moved out of a town and moved out into the country where it wasn't hurting anybody or hurting any any local streams or or affecting any schools. Um, so, uh, there was that particular project. We also brought attention to some, some streams when they had some backflow in or the, uh, some of our local creeks and streams. Um, so we were able to really make an impact with, to the point where we actually had, um, uh, CEOs or people in position in these oil and gas companies come and, and, and meet us and have discussions at these different forums because we came right at them with the same science that they were trying to buffalo people with. And the gentleman's name is Joe Zellick. Uh, he That's lives it. down in the southern part of Jefferson County. You know Joe, don't you? Yes. Okay. Hey, Mark, if I'm talking too much, let me know and just cut me off. No, no, uh, no you're doing great. All right, I I, okay. I I have more questions whenever uh, you, know, you take a break. Uh, but a- anyways, um, so coming together, that, that's why I'm saying it's so important that, you know, that, that as Americans, we have a lot in common. Right now our country's divided over this left and right issue and this coronavirus stuff. And, you know, the, the thing is, is we have more important issues to be dealing with right now. We have issues pertaining to our environment. We all need air. We all need water. We all need the soil that we grow our crops in. We should be focusing in on things like this and coming together as, as brothers and sisters and fighting this, this whole thing, fighting this with science, fighting this with faith, and, 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 and getting out there and actually doing something that's positive for the environment itself. Um, you know, one of the other things I dealt with personally here at home is uh, here a few weeks back, uh, one of my one of my children came home uh, came home to visit uh, my youngest son. He came in from Columbus, and uh, we were out at the garage. Now I, I have a small farm. I, I got just under forty acres, and I, I have fracking going on one mile behind me and one mile. To, in front of my home, about a, uh, in, in the other direction, and um, at the pad that's in behind me, they were happened to be fracking at the time, and we had some tremors that we had to deal with here locally. Now, now I have not leased, I have not leased my land to oil and gas. Um, I, I'm constantly fighting with them about going underneath my properties, um, but anyways. Uh, they did some fracking, and as we were in our garage uh, discussing a few things, we, we noticed an awful smell. It smelled like rotten eggs. And uh, I'm thinking, man, what, what is that smell? Because we don't have any, uh, like our, our, the gas provider in Jefferson County is called Columbia Gas, but nobody out where I live actually has gas to heat their homes or anything like that. Everybody out my, my way is uh, total electric. So anyways, we had this smell, so I look up into the, into the valley right behind me, um, and I could see this yellow cloud coming our way. And all of a sudden, all the birds, all the insects, everything got quiet, silent. You couldn't hear nothing. And I just seen this yellow cloud make its way down through, and the smell got pretty bad. You could smell it, and then it just dissipated. 
And here, what it turned out to be was H2S gas, hydrogen sulfide gas. And the thing is, is if you know, if you get, if you come in too much contact with hydrogen sulfide, it will kill you. I had to call ODNR, which is the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and they sent people out here. And uh, currently, they're they're investigating the whole thing. So. Uh, but that was my experience dealing with a uh, situation with oil and gas, and, and, it, and it could turn out to be very deadly. There's some other things going on with oil and gas that so I guess we can uh, talk a little bit about here in a little bit, uh, pipeline okay. explosions and things like that. But do you have any questions, Mark? Okay, Ed. Um, you know, you've been talking about the honor system, Okay, yeah, with the water, how much gas they extract this month. Uh, You you just mentioned the H2S gas cloud that uh, blew through your neighborhood. Um, What... Is the difference with be, between what so much of our area has to deal with and the conventional drilling, where you see the uh, you know little well out in the uh, cornfield and say Licking County, and you, you get the uh, like counterweight thing in the back that causes the drill to go up and down and I assume it's just going uh, straight down on the one person you know the homeowner's property how long has this fracking technique been around are are the little drill you know the small drill pads doing the same, using the same uh, procedures? Well, back in the day, um, back in the day, frack, or, they did a different type of drilling. They did a couple a couple different. They did uh, um, uh, vertical drilling where they went straight mm-hmm. down, uh, drilling into the earth, uh, hoping to hit pockets of oil, or possibly pockets of gas, but but it was standard. What they were looking for was generally oil. So those small units that you see out in the cornfields and things like that, that's got the counterweight back there that's pumping, they're pumping oil that that that, that they've hit a, maybe an oil pocket in the ground, and they're bringing up oil there. Um, you know, they say fracking's been around since the 1800s, but hydraulic fracturing, you know, has been around you know, probably since the mid to late 40s, um, which is pretty much, it's it's um, it's fracking under pressure is what it pre- pretty much is. And um, to go back to the, 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 the simple way where they were drilling just vertical going down, they drilled two ways back in the day. They drilled straight down or they drilled in at an angle. And the purpose of drilling in at the angle is to hope hope to cover more area because they don't they didn't have the technique that they have today where they could go down and actually direct the drill head to you know to make a curve or turn under the ground and then start to go horizontal i mean horizontal uh drilling has opened things up big time for them um because they're able to cover more ground see a lot of people when you think about two miles you know if people could just maybe take out a map or go to google earth and pull up a map, say of their uh, of their community that they're in, and pin their house, and then go two miles out, or a mile out from that pin, it would blow people's minds. Because when you go one mile or two miles as the crow flies, that's different than one or two miles as you get in your car and drive out the road one or two miles. Right. Because one, one or two miles as the crow flies is a lot longer than one or two miles you get in your car and drive one or two miles. Well, 
I mean, a lot of people don't realize that until you get out west. If you get out west where it's completely flat, and I'm talking flat as a pancake, and if you drive two miles or you drill under the ground two miles, the two miles underground or the two miles above ground is all the same. Yeah, you know, so you, know, uh, you hear that you know it's you know you know this fracking process is safe and it's been tried over the last seventy years. I was like, okay, I don't see like the same kind of procedure being used out in the you know cornfields in central ohio um i'm just trying well, well, to you know, make a distinction no, they, well, they, it, it they, just they, seems like it's a little, a little different no they you know, actually have, it fracking now is pretty much pretty much the same no matter where where you go whether you go out west or you know, if you ever get a chance to Google Earth and, and go look at Oklahoma or one, a lot of those places, you'll see drill pads, the, the squared off drill pads, just like we do that we have here in the Ohio Valley, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're all the uh, hydraulic fracturing is pretty much the same across the board. And you know, while we're talking about that particular subject right there regarding the, the, the pads itself and, and drilling down and for the oil and, and all, people need to understand something, you know, that, you know, like right now, gas prices are, well, let's take about a month ago when gas prices were down to like a, a what were they, like a buck 70 a gallon, uh, a buck 50 a gallon, um, you know, during this coronavirus thing. You know when uh, when people were in quarantine, you know what I'm talking right. about, Mark. Okay, yeah. and, and slowly the prices have gone up. But you know I'm getting tired of hearing the, the pundits on the news and politicians saying, "Hey, you know hydraulic fracturing, we need it because it's, we're energy independent and it keeps the prices down. It keeps you know we're, well, the gas price, the gas isn't going up." Look, people, take out your book again uh, on on fracking for dummies because. When you open that book up, the, the thing that, the, that they're after is they're after the gases. They're not after oil. I mean, oil for them is a perk. It's like icing on the cake or, or gravy on the mashed potatoes. They're after all the different gases in the earth. All those gases are being used to make plastics and computer chips and parts for your cars. That's where the money's at. The oil that they extract from fracking, at least here in our area, in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, has nothing to do with the gas at the gas pump. Has nothing to do with those prices. Any oil, like I said, they, you know, they may frack a well here, and they may not produce any oil. It could all be nothing but natural gas that they're bringing up. So, and I would say 90%, of, of the gas drilling that's occurring in our area, it's all gas. It's mostly gas. I would say maybe 10 or 20% may be oil, if you look at their so, numbers, if you look at the numbers that they're submitting, or if you talk okay. to people like I have that, that are in the oil and gas that work at these various pads, they tell me the same thing. It's mostly natural gases that they're bringing up. So they can make the put the mutanes, the butanes, the propanes, all those different types of pains. That's what they're getting up out of there. So how do they port the gases from the well pad to the processing destination to separate them? Let's talk about that. Okay. Yeah, when they first started doing this whole thing, everything was done by truck. You know, you would, you would, they would be trucking. They would, the gas would come up, go into storage tanks there. The trucks would pull in. They'd load up the gas, and they would run them to the facilities. Um, in our area here, they've had several um, 
processing facilities that's been built. Harrison County here in Ohio has probably got, I think they got three or four huge processing plants um, that they're processing the, the different gases there at these plants. Now what they've done is they've decided to put pipelines in. So they got with the, they found a different, another way of, uh, of kind of screwing the landowner or the farmer by coming in and, 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 and purchasing at, at, at very cheap prices until the farmer caught on. Uh, they purchased right away to put these pipelines through. Some of these lines are transporting raw gas, and then some of these lines are, are transporting uh, finished product. Um, and some of these uh, lines are going all the way down to Louisiana. So they're, they're running through Ohio and, and, and West Virginia and Pennsylvania and all these states. A lot of them, a lot of these pipelines are cutting across Pennsylvania and West Virginia, hooking up here in Ohio and shooting straight down, down to Louisiana and, and Texas. But as, as you know, right now they're looking, instead of sending all these gases down there, Okay, because they're, they're sending them there for two, two different purposes. They're sending finished product there to be shipped all over the world, or they're sending finished product down there to be processed into plastics or other things. So now what do you do? You build uh, cracker plants here in the Ohio Valley on the Ohio River, these billion-dollar plants right on the river where they can dump stuff right into the river. And they're going to build them right on the river to uh, start processing and making plastics right here in the Ohio Valley. Okay. So uh, both of us are downstream from the Beaver County uh, cracker plant, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And then th there's the proposed one across the river from – Moundsville, and that's yes. Yeah, we keep hearing about uh, the official announcements coming soon, and um, we've been hearing that for about what three or four years. But uh, so at these, cr can you explain what goes on at the cracker plants? Well, I, I can only I can only explain uh, my knowledge of what transpires at the cracker plants is kind of limited. Uh, I'm not too versed at, at exactly what goes on there, but from what I'm understanding, at these cracker plants, these are going to be processing facilities to make these various types of uh, uh, materials that needed in the making the plastics and and, and, and computer components and uh, hospital uh, um, um, materials needed for hospitals. Uh, those things will be processed and, 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 and developed there at these cracker plants, refined for that purpose. Now, I'm not saying they're going to actually make the medical supplies there, but the, the cracker plants will be there to kind of make the, the chemical concoctions needed to, to produce what is needed to make these products in various places. So I mean, it's good. They're, they'll employ quite a bit of people, but the problem is here again, you're going to be dealing. The reason they put these places on the river is because they need fresh water, or they need water, and they need fresh water. They can't use salt water, uh, so they they need fresh water. And then two things happen in this whole process. You know, you you got obviously flow back that ends up back into the river. And then you also got air pollution that occurs right there along along the river. Um, you know, a lot of people need to really look at why cancer is so high along the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. You know, if you look at the cancer rates uh, all over the country, you find that cancer is high along, uh, in these areas because of the industrial things that move in to where the river is because they need fresh water. It all goes back to fresh water, Mark. Everything, 
everything that mm-hmm. they do, it's like they need the fresh water to do it, and they know that in the process they ruin this water that can never be used again for, for consumption. Yeah, I, I just I, that that was why I started the show by focusing on how many like crisis situations seem to emanate from our area, but it, the industry needs what we have here: the the water, the. Uh, gas and oil and all all the things that they can make out of it and it, you know there is a plus side that uh people will be employed but we have to weigh that against the risks like the increase in illnesses uh who these plants haven't been around that long. Uh, it may take a while for us to figure out you know, what or if, if there are any side effects. But you know, we know, uh, uh, you know there are some uh, respiratory Ill- asthma ha- has increased. So you know, we have. Is is there a way to find a balance about keeping people employed w- w- without running the risk of uh, illness? You know what? To be honest with you, Mark, I I don't know. I, I really don't know. But you know, the, the thing is, is I think that you know, I, I think that if if in society as a whole, or, or in in the business world. If they could just be honest with the people when they come into an area, you know, we have we have warnings about all kind of things. Like if you go to the hospital and you got to go in for X-rays, they got a big sign up there that tells you if you're pregnant, you know, let the doctor know, uh, you know, because um, there is radiation in, being used in this area here, and it can be harmful to yourself or to your baby. Um, you go buy a bottle of, of propane for your gas grill. There's a big label on the side that warns you the risk of explosion or, or, mm-hmm. or if the gas leaks out, it can cause respiratory issues. Uh, if you go buy a can of Raid to kill bugs in your house, there's big warnings all over that. It tells you about cigarettes. they got a big warning on that. Why can't oil and gas or any of the other industries just be up front and tell people, the risk involved in what they're doing. You know, that there is a risk of water contamination. There is a risk of environmental contamination due to your air or due to your water or soil. Why can't they just come out and why can't our government walk hand in hand? Our government wants to regulate everything anyways, and our government wants to warn us about everything that's detrimental to us. But yet when a, 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 a place like oil and gas comes in, it's like, it's everything's a mystery, and nobody can know the chemicals we're using in, in, in the fracking process. So, therefore, if you have contact with uh, flowback or any of that water from, from a frack well because it's leaked into your drinking water or it's leaked into a, a fishing stream or a pond that maybe you fish in and you come in contact with it, now you become sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor's running all these tests to try to find out what's wrong, and he says, you've been exposed to some chemicals, but he can't tell you the chemicals because if he tells you the chemicals, he could be sued by oil and gas for letting out their secrets. I just don't understand why everything else can ha- tell us the dangers of a particular item or a particular procedure, but oil and gas is exempt from all of that. Why can't they tell the people, and why can't they be honest and say, look, if we, put this, if we put this cracker plant in here, there's a chance of birth defects, there's a chance of cancer, lung cancer, there's a chance of bone cancer or liver cancer. Why can't they tell people that? 
They can't tell people that because if they tell people that, they may say, we don't want that here. But you know as well as I do that even if they don't want it there, if they pay the right politician, they're going to be able to put something somewhere where they want to put it. Right. And it seems that this whole thing was planned in some back room long ago and it it just becomes something that was completely different than the way it was originally presented. It, 10 years ago, we never heard about uh, the pipelines and the cracker plants. Uh, You know, there goes one of the trucks by now. I don't know if my mic picked that up, but, um, you know, we, you know, we never heard about uh, you know, the proposed cracker plants or the compressor stations. Uh, you know, like you said, it, it, it just seemed like you know trucks were going to come up to the uh, storage container and load up the truck and uh, dr- drive away. It, 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 you know, they knew that, uh, well in advance how this process was going to work and you know uh, people didn't know uh, they had never seen anything like this right no I, exactly you know I was privy to to a particular conversation regarding you know the the strategic planning of oil and gas when they come into an area and I, you know, I was told actually that anything that oil and gas does in a particular area, they they already have a 10 to 20 year plan for that area. So they already knew, or they know 10 to 20 years in advance the things that they're planning on implementing and seeing to come to full uh, to, uh, fruition regarding the development of of whether it's going to be a compressor station or whether it's going to be a drill pad in a particular area or a cracker plant or a gas processing facility, they already know this 10 to 20 years out. And they they do this because what they got to do is they got to lay the groundwork to get the things in play that they need. And and to do that, they got to make time or they got to have time on their side to deal with politicians to make sure that they're in on, you know, they're, they're on their side when this whole thing starts to take place. Um, So a lot of these plans are done way ahead of time. So when they came into the Ohio Valley here, they already had an idea what was in the ground, you know, what type of gases they were after, uh, what laid in, in – now, they didn't know exact because even with ground-penetrating radar and all the technology that they have today, uh, I talked to a geologist here not too long ago, and she was explaining to me that, you know, the science is not exact. They, they got a good idea what's down there, but they, all, they, they know for they, – they, they're only 100% sure when they put bit to dirt and they get down in there. But they're about 80 to 90 percent sure what's down there before they start drilling. So they, they kind of know if a place is going to be hot or not. Now, they have drilled in places that they thought was going to be hot for oil and gas, and they got down there and it was nothing. Or it wasn't enough to, to, to make it profitable. So, yes, oil and gas, when they come into an area, believe me, they've already – this the plan – that they're moving into your area with was already planned out 10 to 20 years ago. So this, this cracker plant that's going down there on the river down by you, that was, already, that was planned out probably 10 to 20 years ago. And it was mm-hmm. based, on, based on what they thought production was going to be here in the Ohio Valley area. And it almost, almost sounds a little bit like uh... – you know the coronavirus, but I don't want Nightlight to sound sound uh, too much like the X Files. But uh, 
there's it just seems like so many people now are catching on to this all this stuff is planned well in advance for various uh reasons oh yeah oh yeah um if we could jump back to, to two things I wanted to cover on, on the drilling process, if you don't mind, Mark. Sure. No, go, go, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Well, one of the things I want to talk about to all the listeners out there, uh, and one of the things that we found um, during our, our, our investigation or our endeavors as, a, as an organization was we dealt with two different things, and a buddy of mine, my buddy Bill Gorby, he really dealt with it head on, uh, dealing down in his way, which was dealing with silica sand. Because um, silica sand is, is, is a necessity item used in the fracking process. This sand, this crystal sand, is used uh, to be injected. It, it's mixed in with the water, and it's mixed in with all those chemicals. And it's used so when it gets down in there and, and the rock is fractured, that shell is fractured, that silica sand, even though it's really small, it's in into those cracks and it holds those cracks open so they can extract the gases out of the rock, okay? Well, silica sand has to be brought in. It, it, you know, it's just not right here, so they bring it in out of the area and they store it at various locations. And here in Jefferson County, uh, my buddy Bill was, uh, like he always does, out there sniffing around trying to find out what's going on with oil and gas. He ran into a, a situation down by his way where they had staged or had an area with silica sand, and it ended up all over the railroad tracks down in that area. And what they did was is they told the young kids in that area to gather up the sand and take it home, and they can put it in their yard and use it. As, and they told the parents the same thing. They can use it for sandboxing and putting around their garden and stuff. You know, the thing is with silica sand, uh, silica sand is very, very dangerous if it's breathed in. It only takes very little, very little silica, silica sand or the dust to be breathed in and can immediately cause damage to your lungs. Most of the people, it causes, it causes COPD. It causes kidney issues. But most of all, it causes ciliosis in, in, the, in the lungs. And uh, my wife's grandfather died from this very, very thing here where he just coughed up blood um, and died from it. Um, if you go on to OSHA's site, we got involved. Our, our organization got involved. We got in touch with OSHA and ODNR and everything. They had to come down and clean it up. And let all those people know that they, they, the sand, it wasn't stuff to put in your sandbox for your kids to play in or for you to put in your garden. But that's what we were dealing with here in the Ohio Valley. Again, they're not telling the people what they have that could be dangerous to them. And I encourage all your listeners, please go online and Google silica sand. Just Google it. And, 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 and they got all kinds of notifications about how dangerous silica sand is. And that's one of the main ingredients in fracking. So when you're driving down the road and you see them driving down the road with one of those boxes that say sandbox on it, okay, that's the sand that they're taking to a frack site to mix it, to put it all into the ground there. And it's all over, and it's blowing back on your vehicle, and you've got your windows open, and you're inhaling that stuff. You're causing damage to your lungs immediately, and you're going to end up with problems down the road. Go online and read what OSHA has to say about silica sand, fracking sand. The other thing I want to tell folks about is during the fracking process, when they drill, first when they drill deep into the ground and they're drilling down into the earth, okay, and they're mixing up the, the, the drill mud, now, keep in mind, there's drill mud involved when they're drilling because they're drilling through rock. They're drilling through a lot of stuff down there. So all this drill mud comes back up, and they have to get rid of that drill mud somewhere, okay? Mm -hmm. That drill mud has got radium-228, 226, and 224 in it. Radium is, is decaying uranium, okay? 
And everybody, if you if you if you got a half of a brain, you know what uranium is because it's it's cancer causing. It's it's radiation. Like radium two two six has a half life of sixteen hundred years. Okay, so in other words, depending on the concentration that you get exposed to, you can develop from that. What they're finding out that people who've been exposed to radium two two six and two two eight and two two four is causing there's high incidences of bone and liver and breast cancer. Now, we had an opportunity to take a Geiger counter and take a walk through various restaurant parking lots where a lot of the frackers like to go and um, eat. And you would be surprised how the, the Geiger counter went off from the radium 228 and 226 and 224. It was just in the lot alone, let alone going in and sitting in a booth next to somebody who has that on their clothing and the Geiger counter is going off. But what they do with that drill mud, when they get it back up, they take that drill mud and they go to our local landfills and they put all that mud, spray all that mud into the landfill because that mud is used to cover over the garbage. But now keep in mind, like radium-226 has got a half-life of 1,600 years, or, or radium-228 that's got a life half-life of 5.75 years, that stuff there, once rain hits it, it runs off, and then it goes into our creeks and goes into our streams and makes its way into our groundwater and drinking water. And what are you doing? You're consuming it. Again, where's the label telling us the dangers of the radium-228, 226, 224 that's coming out of the ground? Where is where's the honesty from the oil and gas industry? Where's the honesty from our politicians? See, again, again, I know I keep going back, folks. I know I keep going back to saying, you know, they got a label warning you about this. They got a label warning you about that. Where's our label warning us about the silica sand? that's used in the fracking process that they're allowing kids to play in or that they're traveling down our roads and it's blowing back in our cars and we're breathing it in or the plume that comes up when they're at a drill pad and it goes all over a farmer's house. Where's the, where's the notice? Where's the warning identification that telling us about the radium 228, 226, and 224 that's making its way into our drinking waters or it's all over the guy's clothes that's sitting next to me at one of the restaurants? or it's, it's, it's spilled out in a parking lot somewhere at one of the restaurants because it's on the bottom of these trucks. Where's the warning signs for this? There is none. Where's our politicians warning us about this? There is none. As long as there's enough money to go around to the politician and enough money to go around to the particular people within the community to keep them, their mouths shut, no warnings, no identification, no Nothing is needed to tell the people. This is why I'm so upset, Mark. There's so much going on with this oil and gas that they're just not telling the people. And all I'm asking them to do is just to be honest. Tell the people the facts. Tell the people the dangers of what can happen. And if you choose to live next to a drill pad, you're that farmer that says, I don't care. I'm only planning on living on this earth another 20 years, and I'm going to live in luxury then fine. You were told, you were warned, you don't care, and that's fine. But the rest of us would like to know. And I think, I, I, I think we need to start really forcing our elected officials to be honest with the American people. Okay, Mark, I'm throwing it back to you. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a map of all the locations of the pads in Ohio County. Um, well, the health department has these like blue, like one mile diameter blue rings around the center of the uh, well pad. And, you know, the one mile is 
you know, considered, you know, like the hazard zone or the danger zone. Okay, so what happens, like, do the particles that blow off the pad and are associated you know, with all the stuff going on at the drill site, are they not going to travel any farther than you know, the half a mile from where the the center of the pad to the <clears throat> uh, arc of the danger zone, like you know, so or like right there, you know, the uh, half mile radius. Is there just going to be like a little pile of particulates that build up? Or, you know, what happens if it's a windy day while they're fracking? Are they going to be uh, scattered much farther? And, you know, it's kind of like uh, uh, if you stand six feet one inch from some per- person, you won't catch the Rona. So is, is it like that? Is, you know, what does the sign, you know, the the science on, on well the, you know this danger zone ju- just doesn't make sense. It, it, it's like the same thing as you know you know wear the mask because Dr. Fauci said so. It, it, it's it's like the same principle. It, it, you know th- there are more uh, things to consider. You know like the physics of how far do the par- particles travel, well, no, and, and I, I, what I are the pat- particles? I, I see. I see what you're saying, and it, it, it all depends on on the on the size of the particle and and, and the distance yeah. traveled and the concentration. Um, the wind. You know, for example, and everybody, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the the uh, Cher- Chernobyl incident that occurred over over in uh, um, the old Soviet Union. Um, right. You know, there, there's kind of like a there's there's kind of like a dead zone, okay, um, where they're finding out that not everything's dead within that zone. Everything is things have mutated due to the radiation fallout, but you know they they've got it listed in zones. Like the the closer you get to to um, uh, the, the closer you get to X. Um, the more exposure you have and the more risk you have. The, the same thing goes on, I think, with, with a drill pad or, or uh, um, a compressor station or a cracker plant. You know, the, and I'm kind of impressed there that it, in Ohio County over there that they're, they're actually giving – you said you, were, you pulled up a map and they're, they're giving you like a blue ring mile indicator yeah. around that pad. Yeah, you know, I, I I've shown I've shown it to Barbara. She you know she, uh, you know I I, mean, that, I had to go into I the mean, health department and get it. Well, that, I mean, and that's that's really really neat. I'm, I'm glad they're see West Virginia. I'm glad they're doing that for you folks over there because I think that's real important. You know, the the thing is is we're visual we're visual creatures. We actually have to see something. You know what I'm saying? You know, I could sit here on on the on the radio and and talk about all this, but you know, until you actually see it yourself or, or hold it or touch it, um, you know, you, you really don't live it until you do that. So I, I think with them showing you that blue ring kind of makes it a little bit real. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, if you're within this blue area, there's a chance, you know, you're you're getting these contaminants. And, you know, the thing is, is there, there's really not an exact science mark on, on the distance because it all depends on a lot of factors. Depends on wind that day. It depends on, um, you know, humidity, rain. It, 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 there's a lot of factors that go into the, the, the size of the particulate that's involved. Um, it, it all depends on how far that makes its way out from the from the drill pad. But 
But I do know this, that in, in the vicinity of drill pads, if you take Geiger counters out, now this may not have occurred every single one of these pads, but if you take a Geiger counter out, you're fortunate enough to get close to a pad, um, you're going you're gonna to detect the different uh, radiums that, that have dropped to the ground because don't forget, like I said, these shelf lives, you know, 1,600 years, a long, long shelf life. Mm -hmm. um, and each person, you know, uh, you know, when people go in for, for, for treatment of their cancer and they're getting radiation treatment for their cancer, um, you know, the different doses or different um, – Amounts have to be used depending on that person because some people need a higher dose to destroy the cancer where the, uh, another person coming in may need half the dose that that other person had to destroy that cancer. Well, it, it would be the same thing on the exposures to the radium 228, 226, 224, these different types of things, or, or chemicals in general. You know, you and I could go out to a, a drill pad, and you could be affected by the chemicals and the radiation quicker or e more easier than me. I mean, my, my body may be able to handle it a little bit longer. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing why, you know, if you ever look at drillers, people who work for the oil and gas industry, they're all young. You, you don't see any old timers around. Um, young people because they can go in there and they will suffer least amount of effects. If it, the, the younger you are, I mean, you're, you're still getting exposed to it. You're still going to have an issue with it down the road, but you're not experiencing any of the uh, stuff that maybe an older person would experience because their bodies wore down, their immune systems wore down mm -hmm. and being exposed to these various chemicals or the different types of radium could cause them to have ill effects rather quickly. So when you go to these places, and I, I have never seen old people, and I, and I throw myself in that group because I'm in my mid-50s, you know, I don't see people in my age group working these drill pads. I see people in their late teens, early 20s working these drill pads, usually with the right. foreman who's under 30 working these drill pads. So uh, and there's, there, to me, there's a reason behind that, and I think that reason is, is because them being young, they're least likely to show any type of ill effects from, 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 the, from the fracking process. You know, a, a person that you should try to get on your show, if you can, in, in line with this, is Dr. Yori Gorby, uh, Bill Gorby's brother. Uh, he worked for the Department of Energy. Uh, his degree is in microbiology. And, and, and the stuff we're talking about today, Mark, is just baby steps compared to what he could talk, talk to you about, about the microbes and the different organisms that are deep in the earth that are being brought to the surface that haven't seen the light of day in millions of years. Mm -hmm. And who knows what type of things those are causing in the environment, the damages or even new viruses that, that it could be causing that we could all be falling ill to. Yeah, there, um, you know, the part of the solutions are the antibacterial stuff that they dump down the hole to kill the microbes that, you know, were walking around at the same time of, uh, you know, T Rexes. Right. Right. So uh, Yuri would be a good one on to have talking about that. Cause that that's his specialty, and uh, shoot, he could he could he can lay it on there so thick that you know that way everybody out there knows you know we're dealing well, with a lot I, more I, than just a few things. Yeah, uh, well, and he, Yuri knows what he's talking about. He's also been um, invest uh, doing investigations at the. Uh, uh, that chemical site in uh, Washington State. I, I forget the name of. Uh, it's not Love Canal, but it, yeah, he he knows what he's doing. Um, oh yeah. But yeah, you know, with all and with all this 
stuff that uh, you know, comes back out out of the hole, and they need to get uh, rid of that. It doesn't just stay in there. Uh, all, all of it, uh, most of it, comes back uh, to the surface, and they have to get rid of the flow back. Um, you know, there's this in- injection well um, process to, and it, it, you know that that's been going on in northeastern Ohio. Um, you've had a number of earthquakes that suddenly started happening the appearance of injection wells. Now now you get these, uh, now the frackers want to use these uh, caverns under the Ohio River to deposit this um, flow back. Um, You know, know, we're pretty familiar with the earthquakes in California, um, but Ohio and Oklahoma uh, really weren't ex- uh, experiencing them. Uh, they weren't known for earthquakes uh, prior to the injection wells. Um, what is the situ- situation going on with the earthquakes in Ohio? Well, that, that's that's the other thing. When, when fracking came into our area here, nobody really – I mean, we had earthquakes in years years past here. Um, and my, my wife had told me about some of the things because, I, I, I mean, I grew up in South Carolina. So I, I'm i a, a, a transplant here to Ohio. But um, uh, I guess in years past, you know, they, they've had some tremors along the Ohio River. And the thing is, is when oil and gas came in here, again, they, they have an idea from seismic and other things what's under the ground. But it goes the same thing with, with fault lines. There's fault lines in various places all over the country. And that was one of the concerns that we had with our group here, our environmental group, was, you know, with them drilling and fracking down deep like they were or, or injecting this wastewater deep into the earth, how about if this stuff makes it into a, 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 a fracture there and makes its way back to the surface? Oh, no, 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 that can't happen, that can't happen, that can't happen. you you got to understand, these things don't cause earthquakes. Well, sure enough, uh, up in Youngstown, where they had an injection well up there, everything they had to stop injecting into the ground because it was causing the earthquakes that they were having up there in Youngstown. It was causing the earthquakes. And um, the thing is, is that's another thing people got to realize. You know, when you have a creek or you have a stream uh, on your property, or I'm going to use the Ohio River as an example. And I know this because when I worked as a police officer there, down on the river there, um, the river has another river that flows under it. A lot of people don't realize that. But when you, ha- you have a river, and then below that you have a river. And, and Mingo Junction was a town that used to draw their water, their drinking water. They never drew out of the river. They drew their wells were down under the river, and they drew from there. So anytime that there was a spill in the Ohio River up upstream, like up in Pittsburgh or, or up up north up in Beaver area, and there was a spill into the into the river, the city of Steubenville and in in, in in Toronto and all the all the villages and stuff along the river all the way down couldn't drink the water for so many days, so they had to have water buffaloes. And I don't know if you ever recall that, uh, uh, Mark, in years past where they mm-hmm. had to have water buffaloes. Right, I remember, I remember those. They used to get the water from Mingo during that time because Mingo was never affected because they drew their water from under the river. 
Well, I personally think it's a bad idea for them wanting to deposit any type of flowback, or they're even talking about depositing natural gas, the gas that they extract from the fracking process. They want to store it in these so-called caverns under the river, but they got to understand that there's also a river that flows under the river. Now, how that flows, uh, whether it flows through rock, um, it was explained to me here when I had my well drilled for where I live out in the country that the driller that came in to drill my well, my drinking water well, that is, water here flows through the shell and through the sandstone. It flows. And in some places, it also runs like, like the arteries in your arm or your leg. Okay, you've got water that fl follows along these little cracks, and it, it flows just like a river. It just flows. And what happens is, is when they drill your, your drinking well, they drill straight down, and they go through these various veins or capillaries. And, and when they pull the drill back up, that water flows down into that hole and fills that hole up, and they drop your pump down, and that's where they pump your water up out of. Well, that's same, it's pretty much the same thing that happens like when my creek, I got a spring that, that dries, a, a, a creek that runs down along my house. And about late August, it starts to dry up. I mean, it's not all the way dry, but it, it, the water doesn't flow through, all, all, you know, on the surface like it does. So it kind of flows just below it. Mm -hmm. But if, if I dig down it underneath of there, I got a better flow going on below that foundation because there's a creek flowing underneath that creek. And it's because the water eventually makes its way down and that rock and that so that, that rock and that soft shell and everything is so saturated that water just flows through there. And it just it's a continuous flow. But anyways I can go into a little bit further in detail and maybe on a, a different show, but I find it fascinating how water does flow through the rock formations and stuff. It does flow like the veins in your arm. It flows through those veins. And, and, and that does bother me. It disturbs me when they're talking about injecting below the river or even at these ejection wells where they're saying they're injecting deep down in the earth. The problem is, is if you hit a fissure or if you hit a, a fracture that maybe goes all the way to the surface, that's being forced back up and it's being forced back. It's being forced along its way up, it can be forced into one of those capillaries that travels along in the ground, and it can contaminate that two miles from your home or, or two miles from the contaminated site, which could affect a farmer or somebody who's living off their wealth two miles away. So there is a lot of effect. That, again, that's why I don't understand, again, if you're going to have this stuff and you got to get rid of it, why don't they go to the middle of the desert out west where there's nothing that lives, nothing? And they've already proven that there's no water there under the ground. There's none. Why they don't train that out there and just inject it there if, if they got to do this? Again, why do they find it necessary? I don't understand why they find it necessary to find populated areas to inject this stuff at? Why do they got to go to where people need that water? They live there. They got schools there. They got hospitals there. And they plop down an injection well right in the middle of everybody. Why can't they just go out to the middle of the desert where nobody lives, there's no groundwater there that, they, that they've seen or found, and drill down deep and just inject it there? No, they can't do it. It's like, it's like they're hell-bent excuse my language, but it's like they're hell-bent on finding the most populated area and stick it right in the middle of those people to make them all sick. Yeah, it's, uh, back to it almost sounds like you know, one of the X-Files conspiratorial e episodes, but yeah, that focuses on, you know, like, you know, the Georgia Godstones and depopulating the plant. But, but that's what it, you know, it feels like what's really going on. 
No, I, I, I'm beginning, I'm beginning to wonder myself that you know that there's, there's a big plan behind all of this. I, I, again, it just, you know, it just blows my mind that we as a society can regulate just about everything in our lives. You know, our government can regulate. Now, we're, we're the freest country in this world, and, and I do believe that. I served my country. I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I served my country proudly. I'm, I, I'm a retired law enforcement officer. I served my community proudly. I love the people of my state. I love, I love my country. But we regulate everything, everything. But yet when it comes to our environment, and a business wants to come in like oil and gas, and they want to do something, it's like there's no regulations at all. Everything is just washed away. Everything is just wiped out, and you can do whatever you want. Just don't tell us about it. That's the politician. Just don't tell us. We don't want to hear it. If, if you drill down there and you bring up radium-228 and 226, and it causes cancer in that whole community, we don't want to hear about it. Blame it on... Uh, blame it on cow's milk. We'll blame it on cow's milk. That farmer was giving his cows a uh, roundup, and that's why those people got cancer. Not because they got it from the drill pad, but because they got it from a farmer who was giving his cow roundup, who was eating the grass that passed on the cancer-causing agents to the people in their community. Yeah, I'm and, being sarcastic. And, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean that. That's. I think you have a very uh, appropriate uh, analogy. I, it, it, it it just seems like there is very little unbiased uh, science anymore. It's um, just about it. it just. Say whatever you want to make sure that the what you know the agenda what we have planned actually happens. Here, here's you know some, some money too, but you know you don't have to declare that. But uh, it, it, the, you know it just seems like the facts don't matter anymore. No one, no one cares. There's nothing we, uh, we could do about it any uh, ways. Um, yeah, you know, we can vote the people out of office, but you know, the next person is just going to be uh, bought off too. It's this isn't Ben Franklin's America. No, you, you know, and the thing is with this, Mark, too, is that I, I just. Okay, for example, right, and I, and I know I've, I've kind of hit a, a lot of different things, but I, I wanted, you know, people out there to understand that, that there's a lot to this fracking than just, you know, a, a, a pad put in the middle of a field, a few people making a few bucks, and we're all singing kumbaya because gas prices are going down and we're energy independent. Uh, that's the furthest thing from the truth. I, I, do, I want people to know a little bit about everything. And, and one of the subjects I forgot to mention tonight, because I know we're getting close to the end here, but um, one of the subjects I wanted to talk about was the mandatory pooling and unitization that okay. states have implemented, okay? Because uh, I'm one of the people that, that have fought pooling and unitization, and for what people for people understand what that means is if oil and gas comes in and they want to lease my 40 acres that I have here, and I tell them, go pound salt, I'm not doing it, they can come and offer me money, and I can say I'm not interested. But they can come back and say, look, we'll give you a little bit more, and we're going to give you a higher percentage of the royalties, and I tell them to go pound salt, I'm not interested. They can then go to the state and tell the state that they try to negotiate with me in good faith and I refuse to negotiate. So, therefore, we want to pull him and we want to take his minerals from him. And we want you, State of Ohio, to work on his behalf and draw up a contract and allow us to take his minerals. Now, we're not going to pay him. 
the rule we're not going to pay him a lease agreement up front, but we will give him royalties, and those royalties will be based on say ten percent of production, but we're going to charge him all these other fees on top of it. So basically in the long run, I get nothing, but they get to take what I have. Now, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's only fair that you, you know, that you should lease. That way they can also lease my piece of property, and that way it's all fair. But, you know, the thing is, is I serve my country to to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, that, that's my right under the Constitution, just like it is yours, Mark, and everybody else's. And I just want to live in peace. I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want to hurt no one. I just want to live on my farm and live in peace with God. And, and you know, if I can help out my neighbors, help out my neighbors. If I need my family needs help, you help out your family. But just live in peace. But, no, oil and gas, because they're of their greed and their need, they can come in and force me to give up everything that I have as far as the minerals. They can ruin my water. They can ruin my air. They can ruin my peace and liberty and take it all. And the state allows them to do it. The state allows them to do that. I would think that every American out there would be, would be an outrage that if, if I don't want to leave, that's like, okay, that's like, I guess, going to this mask thing. You mentioned the mask earlier. And there's a big controversy yeah. going on right now all over the country. Some people say it's against my Constitution to force me to wear a mask. And some people say, well, you need to wear a mask. If you wear a mask, if we all wear a mask for a while, we can get over this hump and we don't have to worry about this. But I don't want to wear a mask, so I shouldn't have to. You know what? You're right. This is the United States of America. If you don't want to wear a mask, then you don't have to wear a mask. But if I want to wear a mask, then you shouldn't say a word to me about wearing a mask. If I want to wear a mask into the store, if I want to drive around in my car and wear a mask, I should be allowed to wear a mask because this is a free country for me to do so. But these same people that don't want to wear a mask, if the government comes in and forces them to wear a mask, they get all upset, and they want to storm on Washington, and they want to burn down buildings and scream at the top of their lungs. But yet it's okay for the government then to come in and take my minerals against my will, and, and that's more of my constitutional right than you wearing a mask. Wearing a mask is more of a health issue for the populace. But for them to take my oil and gas that's underneath my land, how is that benefiting anybody else? It's only going to benefit the corporation. It doesn't benefit it doesn't benefit the homeless people in West Virginia or in the hills of Kentucky because they're going to get free gas and free oil for their homes. Because oil and gas will never do that. But I don't understand people in this country. You're either for freedom and liberty across the board or you're not for freedom and liberty. And the point I'm getting at is oil and gas found a way to put pressure on our politicians, to give them the authority to come in and take somebody's minerals and take their property from them. And it's just not right. That's a good point. It, it, it's just not right. No, uh, I think you're making a uh, – successful argument and you know since you know, you're uh, you know brought up the declaration of independent you know the founding uh, documents of um, modern America it, um, there is a There are elements of uh, faith included in those documents. How 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 does 
your unique I think there might be more you know, I I'm probably more like you, you know, like like your kind of environmentalist um I hold the similar views but yeah you know, and and I'm sure there are a, a lot more who you know just aren't as vocal but how 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 does your brand of environmentalism fit in with uh spirituality well it's it. I, I I I got you there. My my belief, my belief in in creation is, you know, I, I believe in, in one holy, blessed God. I, I believe my salvation lies in, in His Son, Lord Jesus Christ. I I believe in the, in Scripture. I believe it is the written word of God. There's no doubt in my mind. I do not doubt it. So I, I believe that God put everything in motion. He put the heavens and earth in motion. He, he created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth. He created all of us. And and I believe that he also gave us dominion over over the earth and, and, and the animals and the animals of the earth. And to be in, in dominion over that, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to the cycle of life that, that our Heavenly Father put in motion, and that is to protect it, to, to do our best to leave the earth in a better position than what we inherited it. You know, I, I try, and, and, you know, I can, I can only do so much, uh, I can only do so much as an individual, but I, I, out here at my place, you know, we're very careful that we don't put chemicals in the ground. When I change my oils, I, I put them in uh, cans to be taken away. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I got one of those, uh, what they're called dragon wands, that you put at the end of your propane tank, and I burn mm-hmm. my weeds. Okay. <laughs> um uh, you know, I, I try to do what I can. I've created some little sanctuary ponds on my property. My, my wife calls them mosquito ponds. Uh, I call them little frog ponds. But, you know, I've created those, and i got cattails growing, and i got colonies of frogs. And, you know, I, even out here we've seen, we've seen an American eagle on a several occasions, bald eagles out here. Um, wow. So I, I try to do my best. Uh, you know, I'm a hunter. But I haven't hunted in the last two years. But when I hunt, I only take what I know I'm going to eat, um, and I'm very thankful for the, for the for for that life that that was given. Um, but I, I I look at at the earth as something that that our heavenly Father has told us that we need to take care of, and and we all have a responsibility to take care of that. And whether I'm a Republican or you're a Democrat or I'm a conservative or you're a liberal, we all have to live here together. We all have to breathe the same air. We all have to drink the same clean water. We all, whether you're a vegetarian or you're a meat eater, we we have to consume the things that are grown here on the earth. That means we have to take care of the earth. We have to take care of the soil. We have to take care of the animals. We we have a responsibility. And... um, you know, I, it, it just does my heart good to know that there's people like you, Mark, that are out there that, that care about the environment. Um, you know, even though we may not share the same political viewpoints, um, I, I, you know, I look at you a, 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 as, as a brother in all of this, just as I do my good friend Bill Gorby. Um, they're, they're, they're on the other side of the spectrum as far as their politics, but – they love the creation that God has made for all of us, and um, I, um, I love them for that. And, and, you know, we all work together to try to do our part. We really do. And I, I think it's wonderful that we can come here and, and come on a show like this. You know, with the, ex- the exception of me using uh, the word hell, uh, it's, you know, it's good to come on a show where it's clean, 
Um, and, and somebody like myself who may have a different political viewpoint can come on and, and share my viewpoint of the environment that, that you share. And, you know, it's, it's a place that we all need to take care of. I think um, early, you know, when the Bible was written, uh, there, you know, there was uh, um, a stewardship that um, was stated in some of the early passages of um, Genesis. Uh, it, it, I think pe- people were aware of the need to um, take care of the planet. I think we've done a poor job uh, recently. Um, yeah, there have been, you know, it's I- interesting to see where some of these frack pads are actually being, uh, once they're finished and in production mode, you know, they're being run by solar panels. You know, there's, yeah, it's actually kind of funny that, that, you know, they use the solar panels to run a gas and oil industry uh, a pad, but they're yeah, so, so we know that they work. Yeah, you know, it's just really not. Um, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. You know, not everyone can afford to sw- you know make that uh, conversion, but you know people have been aware of. You know, we need to take care of the planet uh, uh, do you, do you think solar panels um are becoming a trend you, know, you see maybe an occasional farm in our, our area that um may have some solar panels is is that something that's viable you get the wind uh, the windmills on some of the mountaintops out in central Pennsylvania and get some in Garrett County, Maryland. Um, do you think we can ever, ever break th- th- this developed technology that can end w- what we've been doing to the planet? I, I, you know, Mark, I, I believe – I really do believe that we already have the technology that we can move away from oil and gas. Um, I I really do believe that um, we have different power sources. And um, I, I know when I was in the military, that was back in the 80s. Um, there was different technologies that were on the horizon that was coming out that would make fuel obsolete. And I believe that that is currently being held back on all of us because there's too much money tied up in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. I really do believe it. I, I do believe that that the powers to be have a lot tied up in oil and gas that they're not ready to let that go to embrace the other power sources. And we've seen that in, in a limited, a limited, um, a limited fashion when you're dealing with lithium batteries. I do believe that we have even more technology that's, that's even further ahead than that. Um, 
if I understand correctly, and I could be wrong, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but if you remember, well, I, I remember seeing the moon landing when I was a kid on TV. I, I mean, right. I, I, I vaguely remember it. I don't remember, like, because I wasn't old enough to actually remember, remember, but I remember one of those moments where, where it was pointed out on TV. And one of the things that fascinated me later in life was that with the moon landing, the craft there on the moon was battery-operated. All their tools were battery-operated. And those battery-operated tools had to last for hours, okay, while they were on the moon. We're not talking about a few minutes, but we're talking about hours, okay? And if you've ever owned a cordless battery a cordless drill set, and I'm talking about mm-hmm. the first generation of those, okay? They didn't last long. You, 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 could, you could go out and you drill with them for about an hour, and they were done. You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? Yeah. Okay, but yet, in the 1960s, they were able to use cordless drills on the moon for hours, drilling in, in, the, in the rock, you know, because they were actually drilling big drills into getting core samples. Okay, and they didn't run out of battery power. They were able to run their moon vehicle all over the moon on battery power. They already had some of this technology back then, okay? And, again, keep in mind, when I talk to you about oil and gas, everything for them is 10, 20 years ahead of time, okay? We have the technology right now that we don't need to be running our vehicles on on, on gas, uh, you know, on on, on you know, uh, gas that we put into our tanks. The technology's there. They just not have have let it out to the public. Um, and you can see the difference, in, and I'm going to use an example with our cell phones and laptops on how long the battery la- life lasts in those. I just seen the other day that they got a battery that's as thin as a piece of paper, okay, and it lasts for days. You can operate your your computer on it for days, Okay, it's as thin as a piece of paper. So, to me, the technology is there for us to run our homes on something other than uh, fossil fuels. And for whatever reason, well, no, it's not for whatever re- reason. It's called greed. And, and to keep us all dependent. You know, they want to talk about oil, de- or, you know, oil and gas dependency, you know. We are dependent because we're forced to be dependent on it. But we have the technology. And that's all I got for you for tonight, Mark. Okay. So, uh, Ed, we're down to, you know, last few minutes, four okay. or five minutes left. Uh, is there anything you want to uh, plug, uh, upcoming appearance, or you know, your – uh, Jefferson County Group. Uh, just, uh, I just enjoyed talking to you tonight. I enjoyed talking to anybody out there who, you know, all your listeners that you have. I enjoyed talking to them. I do thank uh, Barbara for allowing me to be on her show, you know, on your show tonight. Um, you know, next time you have me on, maybe we could talk about bug out bags and survival techniques. I do teach us teach that stuff. Uh, it's one good thing about my military training. Um, I do believe that we're, we're living in times right now that things are going to be changing for everybody. I do believe that we're in that time in this, in this country and in the world and in history that things are going to be changing. Uh, our way of life is going to be changing, and it's going to change dramatically. Um, I do, uh, in, 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 and I, I say this from, from my belief in Christ, that I do believe that we're in the last days. Um, Scripture talks about it. It's more of an indication now than it is in any other time in history. Um, people need to be prepared. People need to get themselves right with the Lord and, and to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and King. And uh, uh, just love each other and live in peace. That's all I got to say for tonight, Mark. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, if you guys can... ever want me on again, just let me know. 
That, that, that's fine. Uh, I'll you know, be, be in touch with you uh, tomorrow uh, with the archive. And uh, um, you know, I just want to thank you, Ed, and let the uh, listeners know uh, Barbara and Mary Joyce will be doing their show tomorrow night from 9 to 10, and David and Sean Whittington will be on uh, Thursday. And uh, I just want to th- thank you again. And, you know, Barbara, if you want to wrap the show, uh, we could do that now. Thank you so much, and we'll see everyone. I'll see everyone next. Okay, thank you everybody for listening. Check out our our YouTube channel and subscribe. We really would appreciate your subscription because it lets us know you were there. Good night, everybody.